Welcome. This is Karen Modakaitis, and you're listening to How She Really Does It, the place where inspiration and possibility meet on KDRT 95.7 FM. My guest co-host Karen Walrand is back. And if you remember, she is she was legal counsel, chief of staff of Fortune 200 companies. And one of the things that she worked on was sexism in the workplace or sexual harassment complaints. And today she holds space for me as I share what happened when I went through in previous employment. And it's the first time I'm publicly sharing the whole story, or most of it at least. And and not as a way to vomit on you guys, but as a process and really understanding um, that you're not alone if you're going through this or if you know somebody else that's going through this. This is still in this century happening. And if we don't talk about it, and pretend that it doesn't exist, it's only going to perpetuate the problem. So if we can talk about it, but not from a blaming place, but a place where we share our stories, then we can move through them. Thanks for listening. And I will circle back after my conversation with Karen. Karen Walwind, my friend. Hello and welcome back. How are you doing, sister? Oh, I'm so glad to be here with you today. <laughs> but likewise. So we're going to talk, we were recently together, or well, not so recently anymore, but I guess this year. So we were together in Texas and we had this fascinating conversation about sexism in the workplace. And I looked mm-hmm. at you and was like, we need to talk about this. And it may also be time for me to share my story. But um, so I guess, I'll, can I just start with my story about Please. my workplace? Yeah. So I was a, a college swim coach. I coached at a community college and I was really young. I mean, I got the job. I think a month after I graduated from university. Wow. And yeah, so I don't know how old I was, like 22, 23. Yep. Here's how young I was. We had to rent cars, vans to travel, and I wasn't old enough to be on the lease. <laughs> right. <laughs> I had the same issue once when I was out right out of college as well, which is so crazy. So, but I, you know, I had done a lot of stuff and I, I, I had coached college already because after I was done with my eligibility coach, I'd been coaching for a long time. I was really involved in, in athletic administration. So I had a good resume for that. And I, I just thought I'd get an interview when I got this, I got the job as a part-time at the time. And then two years later, I got the full-time job. And then some years later I was tenured. But, um, so I just worked really hard and I was such an approval whore. And I know that offends some people, but I have to say it that way because it's such a reminder for me because I don't want to whore myself out. I don't yep. want to sell myself out. Right. But I was trying so hard to please other people because I thought if I could please other people, they would like me and I'd be good enough. Mm. Right. So it was this endless hamster wheel. And then being in athletics where it's so male dominated, especially at the college levels and up and wanting to really prove myself and that prove that women coaches you know, could coach. It wasn't just men that could coach and stuff. And so there was a huge hustle for worthiness there. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> and one day, I don't remember, it was like within the first few years, but my AD was at that time really close with me. AD, and, tell me what that is. An athletic director. Thank okay. you. So he was my mentor. He watched me for the first year and then he kind of bought into me and mentored me and stuff. And he came into my office one day and I was isolated because my pool had its own office. I was an indoor pool, had my own office with my own bathroom and my own shower. Okay. And so everybody else is like in the department offices together, but I'm isolated and and I'm really shy and introvert. So I'm not going to go and talk to people. And I'm like 15 years younger than everybody else. Right. 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 So he comes in and he goes, oh, you know, those women coaches, they just don't like you. You're too much like a man. Whoa. Yeah. And, and I liked him and I was like, well, whatever. I mean, if people don't like me, you know, and I kind of puffed up because there was a lot of shame I was involved with. Right. Yep. And so I just hid away more. So I puff up and be like, well, screw them in my mind. And then I just hide away further. So it was like, perfect. Right. Perfect form of em- emotional manipulation. Right. So anyways, you're, I just keep working hard, working hard, trying to prove myself. And I started a program from nothing. There was a pool, but there hadn't been a team and many, many years. And for the women's side, I think since the seventies. Wow. Okay. And this was in the uh, mid nineties. So I build a rather successful program. My school's an inner city school. Swimming is not an inner city sport, but over time I build a a really successful program. And, you know, it it was the byproduct because I cared about the people. And then we worked our butts off. We just worked hard. And I was, I was a hard ass, but we worked hard. And then 
the fast swimming became the byproduct. But so I built these teams and I remember, um, and I had a couple of kids and I remember one point my daughter, my first daughter was four weeks old or so. And I came back to work within seven days. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I was, I was back at work within seven days because you know, this is, you had to prove yourself in this, in this place. Right. Right. And then I had to go to this meeting with the vice president and, um, some of my faculty members, because they said, oh, you know, this AD is really sexist. And I go, well, I haven't had that problem. Well, I hadn't had kids yet. Oh, and after okay. that meeting, he came up to me and just wanted to find out what had happened. And he goes, those women, they just need to figure it out. You're either at home or you're at work. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I was a little confused because I'm like, wait, I just had a baby. In fact, I brought my baby to work that day so I could go to this meeting and somebody was watching the baby. So I could go to the meeting right? To defend him. So I, I was a little confused. I wasn't too smart. I call myself a slow learner. So, you know, so anyways, I had these successful programs. I had state champions, all kinds of stuff. So it was, I think, 2006 or 2000. I can't remember anymore, but I, so 2006, I think it's this century. Right. And I get into a meeting and at this point, my relationship with him had really dissolved, but I get into meetings with my athletic director and the dean and they're very concerned about my ability to do my job. Now, just know, like in sports, right, win loss records are everything. And and I had one of the I had one of the best swim teams on the men's side. We were fourth in the state okay. out of what, thirty teams or so. And on the women's side, two years later, we were fourth in the state. So it's not like I just ran on a, a couple of kids for right, because I had different genders. Right. So I could I could coach, I could build programs with different athletes. So and then the next year we're fifth at state. So we're you know, for people to be top ten is a big deal. Right. So I did that. We were like Pepsi Scholar Athlete Awards. So my teams were smart. So we're smart. We did that. But their only reason that they were concerned about me doing my job, you're going to love this, Karen, is because my husband was a coach too, and they all had stay-at-home wives to support them. They didn't say that out loud. Yes. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, my God. At this point in my life, I was so exhausted because I'd hustled for so long for worthiness. So how long had it been? So 2006, I think I got the job in 95. So, okay, so it, it's been 11 years. Yeah, of me just, you know, it was like, oh, that's not enough. Let me work six days a week. Oh, that's not enough. Let me sh- let me send emails between 11 and <laughs> 2 in the morning so you can see how hard I work. Oh my God, I'm not laughing at you. I'm just, oh my God, this is just so preposterous. So for 11 years, you build a program from nothing oh. to be one of the winningest things in the state. And because you don't have a stay at home husband, I guess, Uh they are concerned about whether or not you can do the work because everybody else has somebody staying at home. Uh And I have four kids. (laughs) How can I do my job? Oh my God, that's great. (laughs) And I I couldn't understand. I mean, academically, we're doing well. Athletically, we're doing well. I couldn't understand it. But I was, this is the part that, you know, I look back now, I'm like, gosh, if I could be who I am today in that room, it would be amazing. I probably wouldn't happen because they'd be too afraid of me. But Exactly right. I was so worn down, yep. you know, and I so did not know who I was. I so did not like who I was. I so did not value what I did. Mm-hmm. You know, even though we had these accomplishments, I remember when those guys first got sta- one state or they I had two state champions and the team got fourth overall. And that night I was in tears and my husband had flown down to Santa Monica and I had a baby and then my daughter was two and he flew down and I couldn't even celebrate it because I go, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this again? I thought it just happened, right? Uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, understand all the work and all the years, even without these athletes that I had done to build the program to here, right? Wow. And I thought it just happened. I was like, how am I going to be able to do this again? And then, okay, so get back to the thing. So they tell you you need a wife. <laughs> how did you respond to that? I, I just, I hustled for my worthiness. I was like, but look, I have a nanny. I have a housekeeper. You know, my husband's a very supportive person. I totally defended. I took the bait and just went further. And of course I was going to do that because that's what happened, right? I was so into getting their approval that if they didn't give it, I just worked harder. So instead, And how would you have handled it now? Now I would, I will, that would be a good question. How would I handle it now? Yeah. I think I would just say, excuse me. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. I'm rather confused. Yeah. I mean, you know, because you said that you would 
talked about, I mean, I think even me and pretty much, I'm like you, I think, I think most people would be pretty intimidated to pull any of that crap with me too. But I think at that, at that point I would be like, okay, look, here's my record. Here's the support I have. Explain to me again why this is a problem, right? Like, yeah. right. Like you want to try that one more time before I call a lawyer? Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you the opportunity to back out of what you just said. It it was, I mean, I didn't even realize what they did was against the law. That's how much I was so in my own shame storm. Yeah. Right. I, that was how much I didn't have my own back. Yeah. And I, and I knew something wasn't right. And I fortunately reached out to a colleague on campus, not in my department. And I just said, this is the conversation. And she looked at me and she goes, Corinne, that's (laughs) against the law. Yeah. I'm like, it is. But yeah. you know, when you're, when you are a victim and I can own that I put myself there in that spot, you don't really realize it. Sure. Right. Cause I lived in that for so long that I thought it was me. Yeah. Right. I thought there was something wrong with me and I wasn't good enough. Yeah. And if I could just be good enough, then they would finally leave me alone. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. What an amazing story. So what happened? Um, so at some point I started real. So with her, when I did reach out with her and I was at a breaking point, um, mm-hmm. because that was just, that wasn't, you know, there were, it was constant, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was at that point working seven days a week and exhausted. Um, and then at that point I went to the union and they backed me. Good. Um, and they backed me not so much, I think for my case, but because they had an ax to grind with my Dean. Okay. And, um, and then the vice president got involved. And then at that point, what we were able to negotiate is I would just be removed from, I would just step away from coaching and then I wouldn't have to deal with those two. And then I would just teach. So I did was that. Was that okay with you? And I was actually, I was okay with that because at that point, right, I'm in shame and I just want to run away because mm. I thought it was, I was something wrong with me. Mm. Right. And so mm. I stopped coaching, which was really weird because I'd always been a coach and I'm like, I'm a teacher. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I'd always been a teacher, but I so defined myself as coach, right? Because I was a teacher coach. And um, and so I did that for a couple of years. And then there were some administrations that changed and I didn't get anything in writing. And so then they reneged and they were going to bring me back in. But mm. the same people were kind of still in power. And then that's when I finally resigned. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm horrified a little bit about this. So, so I, so part of my background you know, you know, I'm a lawyer and I was in house, right? Mm-hmm. For a, so if a case like that ever came in where somebody was, um, had, had complained about sexual harassment or discrimination or something like that, the first thing you try to do is always you move the person who is doing the, doing the wrongdoing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because you, as a, as a in-house counsel, you don't want to ever look like you're punishing the person, the victim, Right. So I'm amazed that they pulled you out of coaching like that to me is crazy. Like (laughs) that to me is crazy because it looks punitive. Right. You know what I mean? Like you're this winningest coach and then they move you because you say that they said something illegal. Like, I mean, I'm amazed that that the law department um, was like, yeah, yeah, move her like that's. There's so many things wrong with this story that are just, it's just making me crazy for a younger you. <laughs> I, I'm so, I'm so horrified. It, well, and you know, I remember this wasn't, so in 2000, when I went to defend him with the vice president and the other female colleagues, cause I didn't have that experience, yeah. right? Cause you know, and I guess I was kind of one of the good old boys at that point. Yeah. And I didn't have that. So there, there was with this particular AD, there was already issues. So it wasn't like I came in in 2006 and this is the first they ever heard exactly. of it. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's crazy to me. That's so crazy. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> and then it was in the 2000s, which is, but you know, you know, here's the thing though. I think you're right. I mean, I think you've touched on something that I think is really, really interesting. Um, and with the understanding that that you never ever ever want to punish a victim, right? Like or 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 do anything that's punitive for a victim. I think when you first of all when you are a victim it can be hard to see it. Mm-hmm. But secondly, one of the things I think that's really important and the type of thing that you always talk about is you have to be so grounded in confidence in who you are and what you and what you do and what you bring in order to be able to clearly see what's happening to you 
does that mm-hmm. make sense? Mm-hmm. So, um, so like 22 year old me, uh, would have exactly like you brand new would have put up with a lot more shit than now 49 year old me, right? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like now, and it's not just a matter of, ex- of knowing what's right and what's wrong, what's legal and what's not, and what's illegal. It has to do with the fact that with experience, you hopefully get a lot more confidence in who you are and what you stand for and what you're about and what boundaries you're willing to set and um, what's okay and what's not okay. And I think the trick is to be able to learn that and learn those boundaries and that kind of thing as young as possible, particularly in your career, so that you can say, wait, whoa, this is not cool. Like, these are the boundaries. This is not cool. And be able to think clearly enough to figure out how to address it. So you're not addressing it necessarily in a, um, in a knee jerk way or in a way that, you know, if it comes down to a legal uh, thing that in a way that could hurt your case, right? Like Mm -hmm. that you can be very, very, um, steadfast and this is the wrongdoing. This person is doing wrong. It's not me. Um, and this needs to be addressed. Right. And I say that without rancor, I say it because this is what's right. And this is me standing in my values. And I think that's, that is a tough, tough lesson to learn. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's tough. I, you know, I like, you know, I, I, I can certainly sit here, like I said, and, you know, in my forties and go, this is, this is what you do. But when you're right at fresh out of college, um, and you feel like everybody who you would have something to say about is in power and can affect mm-hmm. your life. Um, that's a tough call to make. It's so difficult. It is really hard. And you think about like, you know, so I was, a swimmer, a very coachable person, mm-hmm. right? So in, you know, being, and then just my heritage of being Asian, even though, you know, it's so funny because now I always like tell my husband, I go, look, I don't want anybody to be the boss of me. Don't try to tell me what to do, right? <laughs> right, sure. But it was this, I, you know, you want to be well-liked mm-hmm. and it was, how can I please you? You yep. know, I mean, there was, the, there, there were obviously lines I wasn't willing to cross, but, you know, how can I please you and what can I do to get, gain your approval of me? Mm. Mm. And that's a very disempowering thing. So like even when I coach athletes now, it's not about my approval. I always explain to them, I go, this is your relationship between you and the clock. Yep. My job is just to help facilitate that so you get the number on the clock that you want. Yep. It's not yep. about me being proud. Like I won't even tell people. I'm very careful with the word proud. I won't even oh, say that I'm proud of you because I feel like that is me giving you a sense of worthiness. It's something that, you know, I've been kind of, rumbling with for a couple of years. So mm. I asked when I work with my athletes, right? Are you proud of yourself? Mm. That's it. Wow. That's so interesting. And is that, do you bring that into other aspects of your life as well? Like parenting and, and things like that? Or is it different because of the coach relationship? I, I even with the, the parenting, because I don't want, you know, there's emotional child and emotional adult. I want my kids to become emotional adults. And mm. I like, and I like, trust me, you guys, I screw up parenting on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> I screw it up on a daily basis. <laughs> sure. So, you know, like it's so much easier for me to work with my clients or even to work with the team. And then, you know, I come home and it's just, you know, what it is. Mm. But, um, and this morning my husband, he was, he's out of town and we were talking about our daughter and, and how she was really to hold her own ground in this difficult conversation. And I'm like, and, and we both said we were proud of her. Like I haven't said that to her, but like, wow, to watch her, you know, really come into her own and speak her mind to people sure. with positions of power and sure. influence, sure. you know, and say, no, that's actually not how it was for me. I'm like, wow, this is my shy little girl who won't even go talk to her high school teacher last year mm. about, you know, a grade that was not correct. Right. So I, but I'm really, I won't always say, oh, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you because I, I'm very conscientious about giving somebody my approval and then I don't want them to become approval whores like I was. Mm. Wow, that's so powerful. That's so powerful because I, you know, um, I just think about. I'm, so I'm thinking about how how much it means to me when people who matter tell me that they're proud of me, mm-hmm. right? And I think the question becomes, and I and I don't think I'm an approval whore anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I definitely was at one point, and I think that's. Um, true. But I, for me, I feel like it's a matter of being able to decide who are the people who matter. Right. Mm -hmm. And 
and I, like I tell my daughter that I'm proud of her a lot. And I think, and the reason that I tell her that is because I'm so tough on her in other aspects, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like, so when she does something that I think is really great or, um, or, you know, something that, she, that I've seen her work really hard at and she achieved it, um, or didn't achieve it, but handled it really well, right? Handled not being able to do it really well because she worked so hard. Um, I'm, I am actually very, very careful to do the, I, to tell her how proud I am of her. Um, but I also feel like I have to make very sure that my pride in her is about her taking care of herself and her working mm-hmm. hard for herself. And, you know, does, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like it, that it's not that I'm proud of her and therefore I'm awesome because I have this kid that I can be proud of, right? Like I want to make sure that it's not a, that she doesn't see it as a reflection of me talking about my parenting or um, her doing something that pleases me, but I, it's much more of, I want you to see how proud I am of you because I'm watching you take care of your, yourself and learn what's important for yourself. And of the people in your world, and you may decide, she may decide one day that my opinion doesn't matter. But one of the lessons that I talk to my daughter about all the time is you, you need to realize who in your life has your back and that if somebody criticizes you or somebody says, you know, I, I didn't like the way that you did something. It, if that is a person that you know has nothing but the best, your best interest at heart, and is kind to you and respects you as an individual, then that's an opinion that you take over somebody who you don't know one way or the other. And my daughter's 12, so she's just now um, starting to really navigate friendships and understand popularity and, you know, and sort of like, you know, what does it mean if somebody's nice to you and is nice to you enough, right? Like is, it needs to be respect and it needs to be somebody who champions you in good times and in bad times. And so, uh, so I hope that I actually like, I'm very careful to say, look, if I criticize you, it's not, I'm criticizing you because you disappoint me. I'm criticizing you because I want you to be able to, because I want the best for you. And I'm, and I'm hoping for the best for you. And I think that you know that you are capable of really good stuff and right but not because like i'm disappointed because i created you in my image and you have somehow fallen <laughs> short right you know and i think it's a really tough thing that's a tough thing to do now i i'm not a coach and i don't know if um i don't know how i would feel if i was like responsible for a lot of kids right you know what i mean like that weren't mine that were my children and how i would feel about that but i love i love hearing that sort of take on I'm proud of you. That's really interesting. And we've probably gone completely off topic here, but I just, I love that. No, but I think there's some important components because like when you talk about criticizing her, like Mm -hmm. I'm thinking is that you're saying this is okay and this is not okay. Like you're giving her those fence posts. I hope so. You Um, know, and so it's not that you're criticizing her to nitpick at her and just to nag. Right? I'm a bit of a nag. <laughs> well, but, but it's, 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 and it's also not about your reflection of who you are. Yes, right. It's which is really that. rooted in scarcity and shame. Mm-hmm. Like I think about like when we take these actions, where are you rooted? Mm, right. That's such a good point. Yeah. And and so like when you're saying what's okay, what's not okay, I mean, that's like, you know, we're rooted in wholeheartedness. We're saying this is boundaries. Mm-hmm. People want boundaries. Right. They want right. to know what's okay and what's not okay. And it's, you know, if we can't teach people those things, then they go and they're clueless and they become an adult and they don't realize, oh, when you go to somebody's house, you're supposed to bring something. Yeah, right. <laughs> that was me. I didn't know that. Right. Right. That wasn't taught to me. And I'm not blaming anybody. I just didn't know that was one of the life lessons that I missed. Right. Right. So I was kind of clueless at first. Now I realize that. So I, you know, when I look at criticize, I don't, I, that's what, that's, that was kind of my take on it. And, and as a coach, like as an athletic coach, you know, some people will get really upset because we're really direct. Sure. But again, the goal is to get a certain time on the, you know, on the board, right. On yep. the time, on the, on the scoreboard. So that's your goal. It's not mine. It's not about like building my CV. It's not about like, I've already, I always tell my athletes, I mean, I've said this for a long time. Look, I've already achieved my awards. My career is over. (laughs) Right, right. If you want me to help you get there, just get on the train and I will help you. Right. Right. 
because there's so much drama because then what happens is the internal drama of, am I good enough and all of that, sure. right? It's the shame stuff. But um, so I, I think it's just really important, like as we're talking about this is where are you rooted, mm. you know, in this and mm. when you have a sense of yourself. And so the, the beautiful thing that you're giving your daughter is that she's getting an opportunity to, to oh, you know, to learn about, okay, who, who does have my back in my life? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and, you know, and to bring it, to bring it back to the workplace, right. To bring it back to, to what you were talking about, particularly when it comes to some sort of harassment or discrimination or something like that. Like I would hope, and you know, I mean, we all hope, but I would hope that by the time she gets out of college or whatever, and she has her first real job, that I will have done a really good job of making her see, look, I've worked really hard for where I've gotten, even as, you know, as right out of college, I've worked really hard for where I've gotten and I know what's okay and what's not okay. And this feels not okay. So I need to explore that, right? Like I need to figure out what does that mean that I've been treated in a certain way and this feels wrong. And you know, and hopefully in my case, I'm hope she, she'll go, she'll go, my mom's a lawyer. I can ask her <laughs> if this is okay. Right. In our case. But I think that, um, that, that we have to get, you have to be able to go, you know what, here's, here's what happened. Here's how this is. And how do I, how do I move forward in a way that st- keeps me rooted in my values, but also takes care of business. And it's really fun. Like even now, you know, friends of mine will tell me about how they've been poorly mistreated at, at work. And my first goal is you've got to take a breath. My first thing is you've got to take a breath. You have to be beyond reproach going forward. Like you have to figure out how to act in a way that people don't sit there and they go, yeah, but she, yeah, but she, yeah, but she, right? So no taken to Facebook and bitching, you know, like, Mm -hmm. like you've got to be really, really careful here going forward because you need to be stayed very rooted in your values so that you can go forward and people, it can't come back on you, right? It can't back up on you. Um, and, and that's hard because most people are like, but I'm just so angry, right? Like, mm-hmm. like I'm just so mad. And I'm like, I know, but you got to take a breath. Like you have to take a breath. And, and only when you take a breath will you be able to sort of detach a little bit, go to 50,000 feet and see what your next move should be. Mm-hmm. You know, but it's tough. Like, you know, once that emotion gremlin grabs a hold of you, that's a hard one to shake. Well, especially because when you're in shame, which most of us are, right? Yep. When you're in shame, and it's so highly contagious, but when you're in shame, you have one of three ways or all of them is you're going to handle it. You're going to move away and hide. Yep. Right? That's me. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to move towards, which I call approval whoring. Yep. Right. Or you're going to move against and you're going to, and I call that seek and destroy. Right. It's gladiator. Either it's going to be inner gladiator on yourself. So you're going to eat to numb. You're going to drink, you know, yep. shop, whatever it is that's destructive to yourself, or you're yep. going to puff up and tell them off. Right. None of those things are very effective yep. in a workplace. So that's why, like you're saying, getting grounded. Yeah. Right. And, and the beautiful thing is that I was, I was taught and part of it is, I think, my generation, it could be my background. It could, you know, it could be a whole bunch of stuff, but I was taught be a good girl, work really hard and it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Right. And you're going to be safe. And then mm-hmm. I was really rooted in scarcity. Like one of the reasons I liked my job, it was a 10 year job. I mean, yep. it was tenured, like financially, I was going to be safe for the rest of my life. Right. 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 Emotionally, I was not safe, mm. Mm. but I let, I didn't, I disregarded that because I kept saying, but financially I'm safe. Yeah. So I was really rooted in a lot of scarcity, my own personal self-worth, right? Just knowing who I was. And then in this terms of money of, oh, but this is as good as it gets. Yeah. You got to hold on to this because otherwise, how else are you going to make a living? Yeah. Oh, oh, what a horrible place to be. But that becomes like the perfect victim. Yep. Right. That that becomes the the perfect victim for the situation because when you're rooted in that way, when you don't know yourself, when you you don't love yourself, right, and you think yep. there's something wrong with you, and you're you're not being yourself, then you're hustling, then you give your power away to other people. Yep. Yeah. So how do you get there? How do you get to the point where you can be com- confident and be grounded? Like that's right. Like that's that's the whole trick, right how there. How come so. you're asking me the questions? <laughs> <laughs> You're the coach. <laughs> oh, how do we get there? Um, well, you know, I mean, so 
I had to get there by, by, by leaving. Right. I mean, well, one is that I just realized that I couldn't change the institution. Obviously, I mean, the per, the one of the people that did this is still there in the same position. Right. So the institution or the workplace, if they're going to support them and Michelle Woodward, and I've talked about this before, she's a executive coach and you have to look at if, if the company or the organization or the institution is going to support the perpetrator, we'll just use it for that for easier terms. Yep. Then you just realize that that's a culture you cannot change. Correct. Right. So then you choose to leave. And that's what I did. Um, you know, for a while I had some regrets because I was like, I used to just beat myself up. Oh, I just should have sucked it up. I was so selfish, oh, no. mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, Life's too short. yeah, I just, but I did that because, yep. you know, I was the primary breadwinner and, um, and, you know, it created a lot of safety for my family yep. and it took me a couple of years. And then I finally realized, I go, wow, my values were not in line with my department's values. Mm. With, mm. You know, they said they wanted to be successful and win. But those weren't our values. Those were outcomes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. But I thought, I thought, oh, once I'm successful, they're going to leave me alone. Yeah. But it didn't happen that way. So mm-hmm. my, our values didn't align. And once I did that, once I realized that, I remember it took me a couple of years. And it was so funny because I finally came home one day and I told my girlfriend. And she looked at me and she goes, um, Corinne, haven't we been talking about that for the last two years? <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yes, but I finally like, it's it's in my bones. It took yeah. me two years to get it in my bones and to stop beating myself up that I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't tough enough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and, and why should you be tough enough to be abused? You know what I mean? Like, like nobody expects that. Nobody expects you to, to be tough enough to take abuse like that that should not be, ever be right like but, but the trick is also knowing that what's abuse and what's not mm-hmm. and that's if, if you're in an abusive relationship man you know get grounded and get out and that's that that and I say that flippantly but that's a really tough lesson to learn you know I used to always say that I felt like I was the abused wife in yeah, a relationship sure. because that's how it was and yeah. going back to your question of like what do you do I think one of the most important things to do is, you know, like Kristen Neff's work on compassion, self-compassion, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Self-kindness, the yeah. common humanity. And that's also why I wanted to talk about this today with mm-hmm. you was it was so fascinating. I mean, the intelligent women sitting at this table of different, you know, ages mm-hmm. in the stories that we were sharing about sexism in the workplace. Mm-hmm. This wasn't a Gloria Steinem's era sexism. You know, like this wasn't from her time period. This was in our time period. Yep. And I grew up believing that that kind of stuff didn't happen anymore. Oh, yeah. Right. And then here I was in that situation in my 20s and 30s. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And and it happens all the time. And it's, um, and I think what you just said there about growing up believing that it doesn't happen anymore, I think that can also contribute to why you put up with stuff because something happens and you're like, that didn't just happen. Like, like surely, you know, there's a part of you that's like, surely I'm misreading what just happened because that doesn't happen anymore. Right. Like, and I've, I know I've been, I know I have been, um, in situations where I go, maybe I'm just being hypersensitive. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it's 2016 and Mm -hmm. that doesn't happen anymore. And I think that's part of, that can be part of how we get ourselves trapped, right? We're like, this this isn't, I, I must have misread that, so I'm going to just be quiet and take care of it because that surely did not just happen, right? And I, I mean, for sure, um, you know, we're talking about sexual harassment, but that certainly happened as far as race with me as well, mm-hmm. right? Where somebody will say something and I'll be like, that felt really wrong, but am I hypersensitive or was that really wrong, you know? And that's, that can be really tough. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, yeah, but what you said about, you know, it happening now and not happening then, sure. sure of course, of course it does. Um, and I think honestly, what do you, what do you think? You know, we were talking about scarcity and stuff and scarcity is as part of why you stayed, but don't you think that a lot of, a lot of the harassment and everything else that exists comes from a place of scarcity from the perpetrator as well? Like, oh really like there's a lot of shame and and scarcity that's happening there that would that would propel somebody to say or do some of the things that they do absolutely 
Yeah. I mean, like, I imagine that if you were as successful as you were, there were probably, and a woman, and you had the temerity to be successful as a woman um, in a male-dominated field, I imagine that there were a lot of people in power that were like, whoa, 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 let's not upset the apple cart here. Like, don't, you know, you're not supposed to be, shouldn't you have had your babies and quit a long time ago, right? So that our positions would be safe. You know, like there, there's, I think there's a lot of, um, of that. I think that's actually might be at the root of all of it is this sort of fear of, wait, I'm going to lose the power that I have. I'm going to lose this, this, this position of authority that I have by what's coming up, mm-hmm. you know? Well, and if you have a belief that women should be at home, that they cannot do as good of a job as men in the coaching world, and then I come up and I kick ass because that's what I did, then that disproves your belief and you don't want to see that. So remember before, before we got started recording, we were talking and I said, I've really, really in my bones got this idea of this understanding of people like you or don't like you and it has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. And so this is an example of them not liking me had nothing to do with me. Exactly right. It was the fact that I broke their belief. I was evidence against their belief system. Absolutely. Right. And we can talk about this. This can go into race too. Yeah, for sure. Right. For sure. I mean, no question that you, you know, and that's how you get, that's where you get the, oh, well, not you, you're different, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you're not like most women, you're different. You're, you're one of the guys. You're not, you know, right, that, that whole, you're not like most black people. You're not like most Asians. Not, I don't think of you that way. I don't think of you as a woman. I don't think of you as a, a black person. I don't think of you. And what's, what's behind all of that is this really messed up, stereotypical belief system of that has been somehow warped that you are not willing to let go of because I can't possibly be wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if I, if I look at you and go, well, you're not really a woman, right. I can talk to you, Corinne. You're not really a woman. Right. It's because you have to get to the point where you're like, well, if you examine that, it's like, I have this really messed up idea of what it means to be a woman and I like you. So you're, you're going to have to be the one that's different. It can't possibly believe, be that my belief system might have flaws, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where a lot of it comes from. I mean, you know, both of us are, are women of color, and I'm sure both of us have heard some version of what I just ranted on mm-hmm. <laughs> growing up all the time. Well, you're not really Asian. You're not mm-hmm. actually Asian, Koran. You're not really a woman, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Because of some weird paradigm of what it means to be Asian or a woman or whatever, young, old, whatever that is, that you're not willing to let go. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's horrifying. And I don't know. I mean, with everything that's been going on in the world, I don't know how you get people to to shake loose of that tightly held belief system. That's that ends up causing a lot of pain. But it goes back. I mean, and going back to what's happening in the world. Right. So whether it's Nice or in Dallas or mm-hmm. was it Minnesota? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, or Orlando, there's so much fear and scarcity, mm. right? Because mm. it's conflicting against people's belief systems. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there, you know, and there's fear. And, and so, and people just do these things and you, you know, and I still haven't even had a chance to process a lot of this stuff, you <laughs> know, of us have. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, what is going on and we're we're humans like i yep. saw this picture of this t-shirt and i thought about buying it it was like um race or it was like where are you from earth you know race human yeah and you know we're we're humans we and we may have different belief systems or different religions or different sexualities but yep. we're valuable we're humans yeah yeah and that's and that's and that's where the dis- disagreement begins Right. It's sort of like, um, do you remember that that uh, George Orwell uh, book, Animal Farm? Right. Where at the very end of the book. Right. It's all these animals that have power. And um, this sort of end of the book is like we're all equal, but some people are more equal than others. Right. Some animals are more equal than others is sort of how it ends. And that's where we are. Right. Like, yeah, OK, we're all humans, but some of us are more human than others. Right. Like and that's that's where we are. And we end up defining like, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 sure. We're all human, but I'm more human than you because you have this and I don't, right? Um, and that's, it's, 
it's it's a little shaky. I mean, it's a little it's a little tough to do because because then the question becomes how do you how do you get people to to um to open their mind to the possibility that they may have a flaw in their belief system, and that's <laughs> that's really hard, right? Like it's I mean, and I I say this as somebody who I think is very liberal and open minded, but I they, I feel very unshakable in my liberal open mindedness, right? So, um, so if you come at me with something that I don't feel is open minded, I am not willing to let go of that, and so I can be very rooted and close minded in that way as well, right? So, mm-hmm. um, I, a very close friend of mine who is one of my most liberal friends is so unshakable in her liberalism, and you can't she won't she would not even consider an opposing view, or she would not even consider why somebody would disagree with something that she, that she believes. Right. And for me as a fellow liberal, it's not an issue that I'm necessarily willing to push. Right. It's not necessarily because it's not hurting me. And that's where we are with everything else. If you're a man, why would you want to be, if you're a, let's, let me rephrase. If you are a sexist man, right. What, incentive would you necessarily have to open your mind to that i'm still in power right or if you're or if you are an if you're a feminist if you're a man who's a feminist but you have a friend who is sexist right like you can say you know what that's messed up but you don't really have the incentive to push hard on that except for you know some sort of moral right but but the fact is if your fellow men if they're sexist it doesn't hurt you right because you're in that position of power you're you're with them. You may disagree with them, but you don't have the assent. And I think that's a lot of why people are silent about race or whatever else, because they don't, or homophobia or whatever else, because it's like, well, what, as a straight person, why do I need to say anything loud and proud about supporting, you know, gay rights? I'm straight, doesn't affect me. Nobody's trying to hurt me because I'm straight. So I'll just be silent, right? And that's what, that's the problem is how do you get people to go, wait, even And maybe even more importantly, because I am not a member of this group, it is important for me to say something, right? It's, it's more powerful coming for me to say something because I can help change the minds of the people who are in power along with me. And that's just really, really hard because that's more about, um, ethics than it is some sort of, uh, imperative based on your own, your own, um, safety. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Makes total sense. Yeah. So it's tough. Well, and going back to, you know, whether it's the workplace or what's happening, you know, nationally and internationally yeah. in our world, right? It's this power structure, right? Like mm. if they get power, what's going to happen to me? Absolutely. You know, and same thing with my bosses. It was like, if, if, if I am successful as a female with a husband who is a coach, yep. then this disproves my fixed mindset. I can't Correct. have that. Because and not it, only that, maybe it casts doubt on my own success because I'm not, a, I, I don't know if I'm able to be as successful as she is mm-hmm. without the fact that my wife stays home and takes care of everything else. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, do you, you know, so it also somehow minimizes my own success because you've been able to do something coming from a position of, um, of more challenge. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so how dare you be successful? Um, because your success with the fact that you have a working partner and that you're a woman in a man's world means that my success might not be as powerful, Mm -hmm. you know? And do we see it's rooted in shame? It's all shame. (laughs) The the perpetrators, right? are either going, I'm an imposter, my belief system's an imposter, you know, I'm not enough, or for men, right, shame is weakness. Yep, yeah. Right? So then that what happened to me in that office that day was them moving against me. Yep. Going gladiator and coming after me because of this belief system versus if they could be compassionate and go, wow, okay, so I've had this belief system Mm. and now I'm in, excuse me, in my 40s or 50s. Yep. And... What can I do differently? Because the thing that fascinated me with me is both of those men have daughters. Oh, that's the thing, right? That's the thing. With when it comes to to, to sexism, I'm like, I know you people had women that you loved in your in your life at some point. I don't understand why this is okay. Why is it okay to treat 
this woman in the way you're treating them, would it be okay for a man to treat your mother, your sister, your daughters, like in the same way? How do you not, how do you not see that? How do you not make it personal? And that's a, that to me is really sort of stunning to me how that happens. How I, I don't get it. Like, like you're like, I understand that you may have grown up and never seen an Asian or a black person. I can, mm-hmm. like, I can get to that point and imagine that. So, okay, you just don't know better. But with sexism, like, you had a mom, right? Like, you, I know there have been women in your life that you deeply loved and you deeply respected. If it's not your mom, you had an aunt, you had a teacher, you, had a, you have a daughter, you have something, right? How are you not, how is it, where's the disconnect there? How are they different compared to the women around you? That's, I don't get that. I really don't. I want to get it because I think if I get it, then maybe I can fix it. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I just don't. It's really, really tough for me to, to understand. But I, I think some of it is that there is, you have to like really get to know yourself. You have to own your shame, right? Yeah. You have to own your story and not beat yourself up, not go, oh, see, I am a loser, yep. right? But you have to own that story and go, okay, this got me here. Mm-hmm. But now as I evolve into the next version of myself, Mm-hmm. What do I what do I want to get rid of? And what were beliefs that aren't even mine but were programmed? Oh, that's so big. That's so big. That's so big. Right? And programmed by parents, by schools, by communities, by church, by you know. Yeah. Oh, that's so big. Oh, that's you know what? They should just put you and I in power. We think <laughs> that's what I always say. <laughs> Let me just rule the world and we'll be all good. <laughs> Right. Get on my train and let's go. Let's stop with the drama. No indulging in the drama. Let's just go. (laughs) Exactly. That's so big what you just said there. That's so big. The programming. That's everything. That's it. That's everything. And a lot of times that programming isn't even we're even aware of it. Right. We just accept that. Oh, well, women, of course, shouldn't be in the workplace because women weren't in the work. If you were if you were a female coach in the 70s, you were a dyke. Yeah. That, and, and I'm not using that term because that's my language. That's what it was called. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Right. So then I even break up the system more because I'm married and I have kids. Yep. So yep. now where's that stereotype? Right. Right. And by the way, how about the fact that um, women are raised to be empathetic and connectors and, and in touch with their feelings? Men are not. Right. And if you ha- like just societally. And so therefore, because men have been in power historically, being in touch with emotion and feeling and connection must be weak because that's not the way men have been raised. And so you, by version, by, by virtue of being a woman, you bringing whatever I think of as what society has raised you to be in the office, the risk of that is too high, right? The risk of you using connection, the, the, the risk of considering that any of those softer skills, and I'm using air quotes here, but any of those softer skills could be as powerful as being able to remain detached and remain, you know, that is crazy talk, right? Like that's, that's crazy talk. No, no, no. We don't want our, we don't want emotion. And, and by the way, if a woman expresses something vociferously, she's an emotional basket case, possibly on her period. But if a man expresses something vociferously, well, he's a powerful man, right? Like he says what's on his mind. He's strong. It's a point of strength, right? And and how you kind of figure out what those stereotypes for the exact same behavior, how that programming has affected everything is so, so mm-hmm. incredibly weird. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's insane. It's, it, it, the, <laughs> the world has gone mad. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the world is crazy. So, you know, so as we wrap up here, Karen, and this is where, because I know... When, was, I, was I starting to rant too no, much? No, but we're, 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 oh, we're she's out gone of time. <laughs> it goes too fast. It does go too fast. And so I have to watch the clock. But, um, you know, this is what you had to deal with when you were back in oil, right? Mm. In the oil business. And so for somebody who's listening to this mm. and they find themselves in this situation, what do you recommend that they do? Hmm. Well, thinking in my own, thinking in my own experience, um, the first thing I think that I would do is, um, 
if you are convinced that you've done nothing wrong, which is usually the case, right? This is usually the case. Then you need to go back to, um, you know, I don't even want to say marble jar friends, but like who you consider your war council to be, right? Who you consider in your life are people who have your back, who give you wise advice and who want who truly want to see you succeed and, and test what has happened with them. Right. These are these are the people that will also tell you the truth about yourself. Right. Mm-hmm. Like as well. So if it turns out that you're like what hap- what can happen sometimes is you might see something as being um, and I would see this as a lawyer that somebody would say, oh, I'm being discriminated against because I'm a woman. And what's really happening is, no, the guy's just a jerk. Right? <laughs> like, like and it turns out like he's kind of a jerk to everybody. Right. Like I've, I've had cases like that where, you know, you go and you identify and you're like, wow, now he's treating everybody like that. He's treating men, women like it, this isn't really about about your it's not about your gender or about your race. It's about the fact that this man is just an abusive person or this woman is just an abusive person, right? So I think that you need to be able to have people that you can talk to that are a little more dispassionate, but will tell you also about, okay, wait a minute. You understand that what you're hearing here isn't necessarily sexism or racism or something like that. This is just common or garden abuse or whatever. Or you do realize that when you said something this is just abuse and you provoked that, right? By doing whatever. Like somebody that can help you get out of yourself and see really a landscape of what's going on. Once you've figured that out, um, then at that point, um, you decide what to do. If, you th- if, if truly this is a, um, something that you think this person is acting in a value system that is not reflective of the values of the company that you've known to come, then I think at that point you definitely go to HR or you go, you know, you start figuring out how to use the system to take care of that. If on, on the other hand, this person is acting exactly with the value system of the company that you've come to know, then it's time to, as you did, it's time for you to think, well, all right, it's time to plan an exit move. And how do I plan an exit move that I take care of myself, that I stay rooted in my, um, in my values and that I'm not taking um, a financial risk or something, you know, like I'm, you start interviewing, you, have to, you, know, you do your resume, you start saving money, whatever it takes to be able to take yourself out, but you start making an exit plan, um, would be my advice. Uh, like I said, I mean, life is too short to be abused in any way, with sexual or racial or gender, it's, it's too short for that. But you have to be able, I think, to dispassionately look at what is really going on, what, which part of this is the the story I'm telling myself and which part of this is really fact. And once you have those facts, what do I need to do to either fix the situation where I am or to get out of the situation? Oh, that's great. I hope. Yeah. (laughs) I hope that's what I would do. No, I I think it's great. I think the fact that there's that common humanity piece, right? Where we're talking about this so that people who are listening, you know, on this and listening to the show go, Oh, I'm not the only one. Yeah. And then to be really, like you said earlier, be grounded. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and and I do. I say, like, look, you have to verbally vomit. I understand. I'm one of those people. Get yeah. that out in a safe place. But then we just talked about the difference between necessarily a marble jar friend, which is, you know, somebody who's on your inner circle, but they may not understand the circumstance. So who yeah. could understand that and who's going to give you honest feedback? Like, no, Corinne, really, you are just a pain in the butt. Right. <laughs> right? Hey, and, or, and, or, yeah, or no, this isn't this because because there's a whole other thing when you start, uh, compl- uh, you know, fighting that this is race or this is, you know, you're opening up a huge can of worms and you need to make sure that you understand that that is the can you want to open up, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like you need to know exactly what you're dealing with. If you're dealing with um, race discrimination or sex discrimination, you need to know, yeah, this is really what's happening and then go, you know, full bore at that point. But if it turns out, well, no, this person just needs some coaching and they're crazy or they have anger management issues or whatever else, know that too and go full bore knowing that's the problem as well. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. (laughs) Oh, thank you. This is, you always get me so riled up on these calls. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to have to go like in my Zen place now. I I feel so angry in your defense for something that happened 20 years ago. (laughs) But you know, like, I mean, the one thing I have to say, and I mean, so this is 2016, right? So that, that was 10 years ago. Wow. And 
I, I look back at that time and I'm actually really, really grateful. I mean, there were some things just financially to be able to have that kind of a foundation that I had for myself and my family. Yep. Um, and even with the perpetrators, and I remember I heard Oprah say this, like the, to the men who molested her, she actually thanks them. Mm. Right. And mm. not that I don't know if I thank them, but I don't wish for anything to have happened differently. Yes. Because because I was willing to do the work. Yep. I learned so much and it helped me get closer to who I am. Yeah, right? absolutely. So absolutely. we can say that, you know, they, they were wrong or they were jerks or any, you know, the name calling, but it doesn't help. But um, not that, I mean, it, it was my journey to go through. And mm -hmm. um, I, I now I look at who I am today as a yep. 44 year old woman. And I, you know, I don't, I don't have any regrets. Right. Or at least bitterness, which no. is, which is great, right? No. Like you, you've been able to let go of that, which is everything. Yeah. And I don't beat myself up for leaving. Like it was the right thing to do. Yep. And, um, and there, I mean, there were, like I said, there were some aspects of that position that, you know, in that priority of money that yep. did do a really good job for me and my family. Yep. So, yep. and then as far as my own growth is that it was like, Ooh, and that's again, why, and I know some listeners don't like that approval whore, but I have to. Yeah. Have that because it is just a reminder of where I never want to go back to again. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so yes, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> good. Good. Then I won't be so angry. <laughs> Karen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love always, talking with you. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. So we talked about it. There's the common humanity piece of you're not alone. Here's the story that I had. Karen has a whole bunch as legal counsel that we didn't even get to. She talked about some action steps, you know, really check in with your story. What are the facts? What are things that may be going on inside? And then seek out somebody who can be a trusted person where you can bounce things off of and to help you check in. Remember, the myths of vulnerability is you're supposed to go and do this alone, but we all need people in our lives. So, Hopefully you have a team or you've been building a team of people and they can be in different arenas in your life where you can go to when you have situations just to say, wait a second, I'm, am I off point? Or, you know, what do you think about this? Or how am I contributing to this? But really take a look at this. And before I got off the phone with Karen, one of the things that I said was that, you know, I was the ideal candidate for this situation to happen because I was such a people pleaser. I was such an approval whore. And I so believed that I had a belief system that if I work hard, I'll finally be worthy. And by by be, having that belief system, I was willing to take a lot of crap because I thought, oh, once it will finally pay off, instead of really being aware in the present of, is this the right place for me? And instead of saying, this is not okay. And finally, at one point when I did get stronger a couple of years later, I finally looked at the athletic director and I said, I don't even understand. You hired me three times, first as a part-timer, second as a full-timer, and then you gave me tenure. If I was so bad, why didn't you get rid of me? And Karen asked me, she goes, well, what did he say? I said, he said nothing. He couldn't answer. So people use shame to control other people. And it worked for me for 11 years. And it's highly contagious. And that's why I, my work is to do the daring way work and to help people become shame resilient so that they can learn how to move through it, how they can own their stories and move through it. And that was a great part of like my own healing process of my situation in a workplace. And then as I run a workplace and as I do my own work or as I work with clients is how to help them create, I want to say less toxic workplaces, but that's for lack of better words. That's what I'm saying for right now. With that, it's time to end the show and Thank you for listening. Join the newsletter so that we can, we are building a community there. You can go to howshereallydoesit.com and sign up for the weekly newsletter. And until next time, I'm smiling big for you. On a lake, she is dreaming, she is drifting, never been so wide away. Captured in the